Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Special Representative of the Secretary General, ambassadors, distinguished guests, scholars and practitioners from around the world who are interested in the work and study of the United Nations. Thank you so much for joining us today on the second day of the ACUNS annual meeting. This is the Academic Council on the United Nations System. Our meeting this year marks the 75th anniversary of the advent of both UN peacekeeping and special political missions. I'm Lise Howard, and I'm wearing three hats this year. My first hat is always at Georgetown University, where I serve as a professor of government and foreign service. This year, I'm also working as a senior fellow with the Russia-Ukraine team. It's technically the Europe-Russia team, but we've had to shift focus. <laughs> I'm also finishing the third of a four-year term as president of the Academic Council on the UN System. We're gathered here for this meeting, which is generally held in a different city and a different institution each year. Last year, we were in Geneva. Next year, we'll be in Tokyo. This year, of course, we're here. The last time this conference was here was in 1997 at the IMF. We are delighted and so grateful to be here at the U.S. Institute of Peace this year, especially given the theme of the annual meeting. Every year, ACONS recognizes an outstanding thought leader on the U.N. to deliver the John Holmes Address. John Holmes joined the Canadian Department of External Affairs in 1943 and participated in the planning of the United Nations. He was also one of the founding members of ACONS, and his writings have inspired many people uh, for more than 30 years. Now, originally, as we know, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the Undersecretary General for the Department of Peace Operations, was going to deliver this address. He, however, had to go to Paris to be with his boss, the UN Secretary General. And so he asked one of his colleagues, one of his most important colleagues, Special Representative Bintu Keita to fly all the way from Kinshasa to be with us here today. We are so grateful, Special Representative. So, before we move ahead with the Holmes Lecture, I'm going to in introduce Ambassador George Moose, who will then introduce the SRSG and moderate the question and answer, uh, the, the question session. So George Moose was a career member of the U.S. Foreign Service, where he attained the rank of career ambassador. His service with the U.S. Department of State included assignments in Asia, in Africa, in the Caribbean, and Europe. He held appointments as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Benin and to the Republic of Senegal in the 1980s. In the heydays in the early years of the 1990s, he served as U.S. alternate representative to, United, to the United Nations Security Council. In the mid-1990s, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. And for those of you who don't understand, Assistant Secretary sounds like the person who's fetching the coffee. That meant that he was actually in charge of, of all of U.S. efforts um, and on the continent. Uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, he served as U.S. Special Representative to the European Office of the United Nations in Geneva. In 2007, he was appointed by the White House to the Board of Directors of the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he served as chair for many years. He also serves on the boards of Grinnell College, Rhodes Scholar, and the American Academy of Diplomacy, and as a member of the UN Foundation's Global Leadership Council. Since 2003, he has served as an adjunct professor of practice at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, just up the street, the other George University. Akons is now housed at Georgetown. It's easy to confuse the two. Uh, Ambassador Moose holds a bachelor's degree in American studies from Grinnell, which also awarded him with an honorary and well-deserved doctorate of laws. He is married to J Judith Kaufman, a former member of the US Foreign Service and currently a consultant on international health diplomacy. Ambassador Moose, kindly step up to the stage. Thank you so much for joining us this morning.
Oh, good. Good morning, everyone. And Liz, thank you very much for that very, very kind invitation. Uh, I hope you will allow me to begin by noting that um, um, last year's uh, Holmes lecture, as many of you know, was delivered by none other than USIP's own distinguished president, Liz Grande who served the UN for many, many years, 25 years, in some of its more difficult and demanding assignments. Uh, to deliver this year's prestigious John Holmes Memorial Lecture, it is my distinct honor to introduce another of the UN's most experienced, accomplished, and distinguished leaders. Um, as with Ms. Grande, our speaker today has served the UN in many of its most challenging and demanding roles and responsibilities. Ms. Bintu Keita currently serves as the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General in the Democratic Republic of Congo and head of the UN Stabilization Mission, a position to which she was appointed in January of 2021. She brings to the position more than 30 years of experience in peace, security, development, humanitarian affairs, and human rights, with extensive work in conflict and post-conflict environments. From 2019 to 2021, she served as the Assistant Secretary General for Africa in the Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, having previously served as the Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations. In prior assignments, Ms. Keita served the United Nations as Deputy Joint Special Representative for the African Union United Nations Hybrid Operation in Darfur, as leader of UN efforts to fight the Ebola pandemic in Africa, as the Ebola Crisis Manager for Sierra Leone, and as Deputy Executive Representative of the United Nations Integrated Office in Burundi. Before joining the United Nations in 1989, Ms. Keita held a number of senior management and leadership functions with the United Nations Children's Fund, including assignments in Chad, the Republic of Congo, Madagascar, Cape Verde, Rwanda, and Burundi. She holds a master's degree in social economy and a postgraduate degree in business administration and management, both from the University of Paris. We are delighted that Special Representative Keita has traveled all the way from Kinshasa to be with us this morning and to share some of the wisdom she has acquired in the course of her many challenging assignments. It is my great pleasure to welcome her to the podium. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you this morning, but let me start with the protocol. So, dear Professor Dr. Liz Howard, distinguished members of the board of the Academic Council of the United Nations System, dear Yusip, board chair ambassador George Moss, dear Akuns, organizing team of the annual meeting, dear participants, Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today uh, for the 36th annual meetings of ACONS. I am humbled to be joining the list of most remarkable and distinguished speakers which preceded me for the Holmes Lecture representing the United Nations Academia and their governments. 
As we mark the 75th anniversary of United Nations peacekeeping, and also prompted by fast-paced events, not just in theaters such as Mali, but also in Europe, where we note we have not seen such a large-scale confrontation since World War II. The very event that drove the nascence of the United Nations in its current form, it is timely to ask the question about where we are when it comes to peacekeeping and what is the way forward. In MONUSCO and other missions alike, we are also grappling with another question, how to ensure a sustainable and responsible transition in a complex environment while continuing to implement its core mandate, the protection of civilians. In short, we need to identify the right time to exit, not exiting too early to avoid relapse, or tend not to overstay our welcome. Identifying the right time in the conditions we work and reach consensus with all stakeholders is a key challenge the UN is currently facing in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let me start by looking more broadly at the peacekeeping tool as we know it what made its successes, the challenges, and what tomorrow should look like. In a second time, I will focus on a mission that in its last mile, MONUSCO, an attempt to respond to the following question. How to transition responsibly and in a sustainable manner while facing an increasingly volatile environment. If history works in cycles, the tragedy of World War II brought the world together on a unique platform, the United Nations, and its very existence in the decades that followed has contributed to offering the world the time and space it needed to achieve decolonization, desegregation, and the building blocks for its continuous upward trend towards industrial, economic, and human settlement. We, as a global humanity, have also had our failures surface mentioning here climate change. Within the post-World War II, historical cycle and through the lenses of peacekeeping, we have until recently experienced what I would call, with a slight exagger exaggeration, the golden age of peacekeeping. We had a good number of countries who were able to return to peace with the support of peacekeeping operations. Peacekeeping has never been a single magic wand to help a country return to stability, but the political constellation was aligned. Member states were united. Political processes and peace agreements were implemented, and as a result, countries such as Sierra Leone, Cambodia, Namibia, Côte d'Ivoire, Liberia and Timor-Leste were able to transition from conflict to sustained peace. Another achievement by our peacekeepers is the protection of hundreds of thousands of civilians caught, in, caught up in conflict. I see this first and in Eastern DRC, for instance, in a displacement camp in Uturi province, which Under Secretary General Jean-Pierre Lacroix just visited recently, where peacekeepers protect 
60,000 people from being assaulted. These peacekeepers also provided sanctuary to more than 2,000 civilians at a base in Kichanga when M23 took control of the area in January, so very recently. And the peacekeepers have prevented potential massacres by Kodeko in the Roe and Loda displacement site in Ituri. And here we fall for another, what I call narratives, which I found being a fallacy, where peacekeepers are seen as ineffective because civilians still get killed and hurt in the proximity of our presence, while in fact our presence results in protection as evidenced, unfortunately, by the ever-growing number of civilians populating the protection sites while the claimed ineffectiveness, if real, would have necessarily had led to a depopulation of these sites. Just to give you a number, in DRC, we are talking about 6.3 million of internally displaced people. This is not to say that we have not had our collective share of failures from Srebrenica and Rwanda to South Sudan and Mali, but we shouldn't also shy away from recognizing that millions are alive because the United Member States mobilized blood, sweat, and tears to maintain a peacekeeping force in the middle of conflicts and active combat theaters throughout the world. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. In regard to the challenges we face, the first challenge is the division among the international community because every single peacekeepers or every single peacekeeping operation is political. Whether it is monitoring ceasefires through military observers or a large multidimensional mission, the common denominator for success remains the political efforts to promote durable solutions. We need unity of purpose among the members of the Security Council and their active common commitment to supporting these peace efforts. Unfortunately, today, none of the 12 existing peacekeeping missions has an immediate significant prospect of political processes moving forward. In Eastern DRC, for instance, protracted conflicts fueled by fragile or the absence of state institutions and the unilateral interest of regional actors and illicit economies that continue to sustain a plethora of non-state armed groups have robbed generation of Congolese of a peaceful life and opportunities for sustainable, equitable, and inclusive development. The world's richest country in mineral resources cannot capitalize on it. And the whole world and our new industries cannot benefit from it as long as spoilers motivated by very narrow interest hold the upper end. As an African myself, I am deeply embittered by this prolonged conflict-driven cycle. The political conditions for United Nations operations to play a constructive role and to deploy are changing. And the challenge remains to find creative ways to contribute to peace and security and adapt current operations to respond to the emerging geopolitical landscape. The second challenge is the deteriorating security where peacekeeping operations are deployed. For example, in the year 22, 
was the second deadliest year in the history of the United Nations operation in the DRC after 2017, which claimed the lives of 13 peacekeepers in violent attacks. And like in Mali, in addition to direct attacks on peacekeepers, the DRC is facing the threat of improvised explosive device. Among the 13 peacekeepers that lost their lives in 22, four of them were killed due to the nefarious environment that was created by negative messages, myths, and disinformation about MONUSCO. Like MONUSCO, several peace operations are facing growing disinformation narratives aiming at undermining their credibility and their legitimacy. Myths and disinformation, as well as hate speech, can also exacerbate mistrust between and within communities. In several missions context, we see that different security actors have seized upon the rapid spread of information through digital platforms in a sense, what we have seen could be termed as weaponized social media. And it is my belief that this is not enough taken into consideration. As Professor Howard highlighted in the extraordinary relationship between peacekeeping and peace, negative perceptions of peace operations to a degree are based on media coverage that tends to spotlight failures and abuses rather than positive results. The challenge for the mission is for the voices of those in the Eastern DRC provinces that are protected by MONUSCO to be heard above and truly above that are propagating myths and disinformation. In addition, DRC being the size of a continent in itself, the realities from one side of the country and the other side, thousands of miles away, are vastly different. And not all stakeholders are indeed interested or even able to understanding the other side's reality. Third, we are affected by the evolving nature of conflict. Many of the contexts in which missions operate are impacted by climate change and transnational criminal activity, including illegal extraction of natural resources. In the DRC, we observe several conflict layers that each require a set of targeted interventions which address the grievances of people and take into account existing power dynamics and conflict drivers, often linked to identity and truly identity. Armed groups must be understood as economic or ideological entrepreneurs, and solutions must address their interest to change their behavior towards citizen and state institutions. A focus on addressing the economic causes of instability should therefore be a central pillar of reformed initiatives addressed through stronger collaboration and international financial institutions and member states driving the global agenda, including on renewable energy and reduced carbon emissions to meet the climate goals. As you know, the DRC is often referred to as a country with untapped potential and with its natural resources holding the prospect of unprecedented development and prosperity. Therefore, the governance dimension of peace operations mandates must be in the forefront and understood as a crucial dimension of human security and the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. The winner takes it all 
and zero-sum optics has been the recipe for disaster. Economic development across communities, shared access to means for prosperity and social betterment are the tools to rebuild the social fabric and to do away with internal conflict. Linking mandates of peace operations with the development agenda. Everyone talk about the triple nexus. How everyone is really working the talk for the triple nexus? I have my questions mark. Anyway, Linking it with the increasingly important to the development agenda, we support these efforts seeking greater integration with the United Nations country team and closely working with the World Bank and the European Union, accelerated by the context of the mission's transition. And I want to make a pause on the accelerated uh, today, we are in the world of uh, social media. Everything has to be instantaneous. Uh, so every recipe, quote unquote, has to be also like instant. So instant coffee, instant everything. So instant peacekeeping, instant development. Everything has to be instant. This is, this is the world we are living in. More broadly, most of the conflicts we are involved in are of a regional nature or significantly influenced by regional tensions. I can give the example of Eastern DRC once again, which is a regional conflict with the M23 as its poster group. The regional dimension of the M23 crisis has been fully acknowledged and the Luanda roadmap is recognized as the instrument established to de-escalate tensions between the DRC and Rwanda. This begs the question of how United Nations peacekeeping can better respond to regional conflict. I will not enter here into the discussion of the functioning of the Security Council. It's a long, 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 long term. <laughs> and the need for its decisive and common stance. No, I will enter into the discussion on the scope and adoption of missions mandates. There are plenty of workshops on how to uh, remove the Christmas tree mandates to something which is uh, simpler, but yet my experience, I have 40 pages to explain to me what the mandate has to be. And it's also important that I'm not going to go into the discussion on predictable funding, and adequate resourcing with personnel and material. Because the financial cliff is always something that we are very comfortable discussing. I will just mention my firm belief that as grassroots bottom-up approaches are a necessity for success and operation at operational level, the overall success is similarly contingent on decisive action on the top-down coordinate, so the political level. First, we need to continue to follow through on the action for peacekeeping and action for peacekeeping plus. And soon, we may need to have action for peacekeeping plus plus. This includes, among others, enhancing accountability to and of peacekeepers the safety and security of peacekeepers, including through actively mitigating the threat of improvised explosive devices, utilizing a number of tools to assess and strengthen performance, advancing the strategy for the digital transformation of peacekeeping, and also including working at a much higher level a scaled up level on myths and disinformation. And we have to continue. Every day when I'm in the field, in meetings in Kinshasa or in meetings elsewhere, pictures are taken. I always look at the pictures. And I say to myself, my, my day 
may come when I will no longer have to count how many women are in the pictures. Still a long way to go, a lot of efforts, but a long way to go. There will be, as I said, maybe uh, action for peacekeeping plus plus. I believe that one of the key focus area will be to accelerate the digital technology. But to do so, we need more resources. And this is not something that people are ready to do. They are more interested how, how much can we save than what is the right thing to do with the proper investment. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of digital dimension for peacekeeping and the transformation that is required. However, second, I think it's important to talk also about how to address the new emerging aspect of peacekeeping. And in this, we have what I call the mandates that are expanded and we have to be able to look into the transnational level of the mandates. Because as I said, most of the uh, situations that we are faced with are no longer within the boundaries and the confines of one country. They are interconnected with neighbors, beyond the neighbors. So we have to have tools that respond to that. The third uh, aspect which I want to uh, talk about here is these days you open any new paper or you go to the social media, it's are we doing peacekeeping or are we doing peace enforcement? If you are not doing peace enforcement, you are useless. And basically this is what is being spin on the continent. And we believe that we need both. We need a combination of peace enforcement and we need also peacekeeping and we need also peacemaking. So the title of this uh, 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 lecture for today is absolutely right. We need different instruments for different moments and different circumstances. And finally, uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, last aspect I wanted to share here is with regard to what I will call, should we just stop fantasizing and romanticizing around the various uh, aspects of the peacekeeping and the peace enforcement? Can we have an adult conversation on what it means depending on the situation on the ground? And now, I said that I'm going to touch on the transition, and I know that I've been speaking already for quite some time, so let me try to go as quick as I can uh, to enable sufficient time for the Q&A. So here I am uh, at the helm of a mission called MONUSCO, where it reminds me when I went to fight Ebola in West Africa on uh, February 2015, I was told, been to your mandate is the following. You have to drag Ebola to zero, and you have to close the mission, Yunmir, on 30th of June. Believe me or not, we did. We didn't drag uh, Ebola to zero on June 2015. We did it in November 2015. So here is, been to your mandate with your team is to close the mission through a transition drawdown and exit, and at the same time, you have a mandate which has three core priorities, which is protection of civilian, a, a program for disarmament, demobilization, community reintegration and stabilization, and you also have to do security sector reform. These are the three, and I'm not talking about all the cross-cutting that have been added, uh, because all of this has to be done in, during this transition. And the government has said, well, uh, the transition is going to take, uh, 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 is going to be shortened instead of 20, 2014, it's going to be end of 2023, 20, uh, which is like six months from now, and all the benchmarks have to be accomplished, and then the country team is going to take over. And when we say, actually, the government will have to take over because the government is in charge. So this is the situation we are finding ourselves. So this is why I said the conundrum of getting 
into a transition discussion in an electoral year with myths and disinformation and also member states who are looking at should we listen to the end state or are we going to have a conditions based? So those two elements are going together. But at the end, uh, my biggest, biggest, biggest concern is we are having a dialogue and a meaningful dialogue with the government officials. We want to expand it to the uh, uh, civil society organization and the partners at large because we have B and multilateral partners that are accompanying DRC. So we are not alone in the uh, theater of operation. But then it's like, you know, the last mile is always the one where you have to run because we were in 13 provinces. Nowadays, we are in three. These are the three most difficult, Ituri, uh, North Kivu, and uh, South Kivu, because this is where we have most of the armed groups. And for that, we also have to take care of the people. And when I say the people, the people of the country, but also the people within the mission. Uh, because again, uh, we are not talking about just numbers, we are talking about individuals, and we are talking about human beings. So I believe that as part of the transition discussion, beyond what we are used to be discussing, it's important to remember that there are men and women who are serving a common purpose, and the human aspect of the process has to be very much at the center of what we are talking. And concluding, remember what I said at the beginning? They are false narratives, they are myths and disinformation, they are interest in uh, decredibilize of the mission, the peacekeeping, and uh, they are vested interest. Despite all of this, we have to keep fighting in the right sense of fighting, that this is a tool, a tool which is still relevant, and uh, we still have to remember we have millions of civilians worldwide who continue to rely on the United Nations to protect them from violence and uphold their human rights, and particularly where we have peace operations. We owe it to them to ensure our operations serve them, and I insist, them, not the institutions, not the interest elsewhere, but the people on the ground, and that they can count on us to support them in following evidence-based, critical, and impact-focused analysis in making this a reality. Not the, what we have in our mind, the knowledge that we have acquired somewhere else, the templates that we have, but what people really want and how we can accompany them. I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we can continue to count on your support, uh, not to just the United Nations and peacekeeping as such, but also on your contributions to devising new ways of stopping the scourge of war so that people over the world can share the benefits of peace and prosperity where they are and live. And maybe this will also remove some of the anxieties and uh, all the programs that we are hearing around migration and all of these things, if people can live where they are. I have three decades with the UN and I'm not done yet <laughs> because we are all not done yet. Let me thank you, Madam Special Representative, for laying out, outlining a daunting set of challenges that you face on the ground daily in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but which we need to be aware of if we are to be at all relevant to helping you address, deal with, manage those challenges. Um, there is so much in, what, in your remarks that is worthy of deep, deep reflection and conversation. And sadly, 
we will not have enough time here this morning to be able to delve into all of them. Um, I was reminded, as I shared with you uh, earlier today, that, mm -hmm. that it is almost eight years to the day when the high-level independent panel on peace operations issued its report June 16th of 2015, and we had the great pleasure of uh, receiving, having on this very stage, former President uh, Ramos Corta, the chair of that panel. Now, what did you just talk a little bit more? You, you identified a number of things in your... Oh, by the way, let me just remind our, our uh, colleagues who are listening in online, um, if they have a question, uh, please uh, do post it through the Aikens portal. But I wondered if you would talk a little bit about, you know, you've touched on many of them, talk a little bit about the changes that have taken place even in the last eight years, in particular the nature of conflict. You touched on that. Uh, how has conflict changed, and how have the actors who occupy that conflict space changed in the last eight years? Thank you. I, I do believe that uh, one key element we have not taken into consideration in the landscape of the uh, changing circumstances over the years is that the people uh, in the countries are changing. The people in the countries are also uh, having access to more information, including mis- and disinformation. And I believe also that uh, we forgot that a number of the um, cadres that we have in country have also learned and have uh, uh, gone through some of the prestigious universities in America, in Canada, in so many uh, uh, other places, and they are coming back to the country. So we have to be able to impact knowledge in a very different way of uh, the way we, we thought we were coming, there is a void. So the void is with the templates and uh, all the things that uh, we've learned uh, over, or, over time. And so for me, the, the way we look at the population, the way we look at the young people, and particularly on the continent, uh, because this is where I'm focusing my attention, because this is where I'm working, um, this youth bulge is not something which we have to put aside. There is a United Nations Security Council resolution, the 2250, which now talk about youth, peace, and security. In my view, this is one place we are not paying enough attention in terms of what this means, this Security Council resolution, including the United Security Council resolution 1325 for women, peace, and security, where we have an intergovernmental uh, approach, and more and more and more every day, these intergovernmental approaches are challenged by the very people these are supposed to be supporting. So that, for me, is something which has not yet been internalized, neither in the conversations, neither in the way we organize the meetings, neither all the consultations, and neither in the way we do the program, the mandates, and even, I would say, the bilateral and multilateral engagement. So there is still a lot to be, to be done in that form. I want to invite questions from the audience while we're waiting for those. Well, we already have hands up here. So why don't, why don't we do that? But I wondered, I just have an impression that we, um, we, the member states, are very fond of going to the Security Council, taking our problems there and parking them on the door of the Secretary General and, and saying, please help us, please solve this problem for us. But we are not always as president in that space as we need to be, at least that's my impression. What, what, what do you think about the nature of our partnership, our cooperation in the field with the UN? Where, where are we uh, failing to live up to our part of this bargain? We can't live it, leave it all in your hands. I, I like the way you frame this. <laughs> because clearly, uh, if, if I want to be very genuine about that partnership, yes. It looks like at times that we are abandoned with the, with the issues. Yes. Uh, and because there is a mandate, so the Security Council is comfortable that once the mandate is given, 
you deal with it. But it's forgetting that the political steer yes. has yet to be with the Security Council. After all, when I'm in the field and I'm meeting the women and the young people, they are telling me the world governance body, where are they? in relation to what is going on in Eastern DRC. And yet there was a visit very recently, and I'm very happy for that visit, because actually they didn't stay in Kinshasa. They went to Goma, and they went and visited some of the IDP sites, yeah. internally displaced people sites, uh, and had the first-hand experience of the suffering of the people, not because there is no money not because there is no resources overall, but because there is a lot of tiptoeing mm. around qualifying what is happening in Eastern DRC. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the issue that we have grappling every single day, where the country is saying, I have a situation where no one wants to qualify. Mm -hmm. Why is it that in some other places in the world, qualifications are very quick, and even mobilizing and rallying a number of member states around it. Yes. Why is it so different in the context, the context. of Eastern DRC? Yes. So yes. the political steer and the political engagement in order to uh, uh, harness the goodwill and the messaging, the diplomacy around what is happening, for me, is, there is a, a scaling up to be, to, to be done. It's an issue I would like to pursue much longer. I see there's a hand here on the left. Walter Dorn from the Royal Military College of Canada. Um, you lead a mission which has used armed force for protection of civilians more than any other mission in UN history. And you called for an, a mature discussion on peace enforcement uh, where you look at the conditions. So I would like to ask you, what conditions do you see for the use of force, particularly when government and many Congolese are calling for the UN to use more force, like against the M23? Well, this is, this is why uh, this is part of my daily uh, brainstorming with my colleagues on the ground and also with uh, different member states, which is a peacekeeping operation, even with a robust mandate, Chapter 7. Um, is not to go into a war. Uh, and, and, and I think we have to be upfront about it, not being shy and say, our role is not to go to war. Our role is to uh, uh, go for peace, peacemaking, and uh, when peace is there, peace are sustaining. This is, this is our role. And so I'm very glad that the, the, the Secretary General is acknowledging the fact that some other, and particularly when we look at the uh, chapter eight of the, uh, uh, the, the charter, to say there may be some other stakeholders who are best fitted to do that peace enforcement. So reason why, personally, at the helm of the mission MONUSCO, I'm welcoming to the East African Regional Force and also maybe soon to be deployed the SADC Force because they will have that offensive nature uh, which we, as uh, Chapter 7, we cannot go the way it is uh, going to be done by the others. And one particular aspect of it is the human rights due diligence policy. Mm. We, in our mandate, are clearly, clearly told even in joint operation when you are supporting a national army or the police, security forces, uh, by the way, uh, if you cannot uphold the human rights due diligence policy, you have to withdraw from the joint operation. And this is one of the causes of anger from uh, the population because at some point we had to make decisions based on the implementation of the HRDDP. So uh, just to, to, to clarify that, yes, it is, it is an issue, and uh, we are not, uh, in my view, equipped to go to war. And especially if you have the interlinkages with the uh, um, neighboring countries. So what it means, are we saying that we have to reinforce the peacekeeping? So then the peacekeeping is going into interstate type of war? 
I don't believe that this is uh, uh, where we want to go. I understand we have one question from online. Yes, Christina Petku of Manusma in Mali asks, um, in your opinion, what type of African solutions should the new agenda for peace consider to address the conflicts on the African continent? Could you repeat it in a little louder? Of course, yeah. So Christina Petku of Manusma in Mali, she asks, in your opinion, what type of African solutions should the new agenda for peace consider to address the conflicts on the African continent, especially at a time of increasing crisis of confidence between transition authorities and various countries and UN missions, which end up mostly affecting the local populations? African solutions and what contributions? <laughs> Africans are already making such... Yeah, and, and, and actually, I have to say, even though uh, there is a lot of criticism around of the deployment of the uh, East African Regional Force, or even some of the um, uh, implement, parts of the implementation of the Rwanda, uh, Rwanda, Luanda roadmap, uh, which has been established on the uh, 6th of July last year, um, we have to say that in few months in North Kivu, we have seen more than close to one million internally displaced people. And so that means that people are not going anywhere. They are not living in good conditions. Children are not going to school. And on top, we also have heightened level of sexual violence and gender-based violence in those IDP sites. So my, my, my response, if, if, if I can, would be to say that somehow the school of thoughts between Western and the other part of the world, we have to come to a common ground of understanding that there should be mutual respect on the knowledge which is coming from the ground up and being humble enough to acknowledge that we don't know it all because we are coming from the other part of the world. That, for me, is, is one of the uh, challenges I, I see. And I see it every day. Special Representative Keita, there is so much more that I know our audience would love to hear from you um, with great regret. We will have to end this session because we have other events to follow on. These days. But I want to thank you sincerely. Um, first and foremost, for your simply being here, coming so far to be with us this morning, but also for sharing your wisdom with us this morning. And we Thank wish you, you all so the much. best, and we will more than wish. We are going to work harder to do our best to support you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.